And we're back for another episode of Start Up Hustle, a podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. If you want to start, own, or build a business, then you're in the right place. We bring you the real truth about what it's like to take something from concept to launch, from growth, innovation, experience, failing, or winning big, we've got you covered. So let's get down to business with another episode of Start a Puzzle, brought to you by Fullscale.io. And we're back. Another episode of Start a Puzzle. Matt DeCourcy here for another exciting conversation that hopefully makes a difference in your life. Now, I am really excited about today's topic because nearly 400 episodes in on Start a Puzzle, we have had a recurring theme from so many different people that was related to how to slice up the pie. And I don't mean apple pie, people. I mean the pie known as your business. And we have had so many people talk about, I get this question a lot at full scale as an investor is what, how do we split up equity? Now, before we get into that, I do need to let you know that today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Crown CFO. They offer fractional CFO services for any size business. You can get the impact of a CFO for a fraction of the cost. Visit crowncfo.com forward slash hustle and you can learn more about them. With me today, I have Mike Moyer, and Mike is the inventor of Slicing Pie. Now, what is that? Scroll on down to the show notes and click the link for Slicing Pie or go to slicingpie.com. This guy's invented the calculator that you need to talk about fair equity split. So, Mike, welcome to Startup Hustle. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I'm glad to get you in here because, like I said, this has been a hot topic. So, and we agreed before we hit record that we both, just in general, like pie and that it's delicious. Can we confirm that? Definitely. Yeah, especially a la mode. <laughs> oh, it, I, I, I'm I'm an apple pie guy. I like good pumpkin pie too, especially if it has way too much whipped cream on it. But yeah. that's not the pie we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about your version of slicing pie. Now, before we get into what fair equity splits are, venture capital, all this stuff, and once again, go to slicingpie.com so you can follow along. Let's get a little bit of your backstory in here, my friend, and what brought you to the point that you became the inventor of slicingpie.com. Well, I started my first company when I was a student at University of Kansas. It was a t-shirt company. Rock Chalk. Rock Chalk Jayhawk. Yep. I uh, yeah. started business. Yeah. I, I wasn't a very good student. My parents decided I, they weren't going to pay for my education. I should come home and get a job. Done that too. Yeah. So but done that too. Right out of KU myself. Yeah, so I get it. I yeah. decided instead of getting a job, I'd start a company. And I started a t-shirt company and, and did some light manufacturing of outdoor clothing. And I uh, I ran that for a number of years and sold it and um, moved to Texas and did some startup work for a guy sort of as an employee. And I um, went from established company to startup company back and forth throughout my life over the next 15, 20 years. Um, I started a company that did uh, marketing technology for uh, veterinary offices. I started a business called capex.com, which was um, uh, did education stuff. And my first company I, I invested, after I sold my first company, I, um, I made some money and I invested in the stock market during the dot-com bubble, made some more money. And so um, I was doing quite well early in my life. And I got married and bought a house and quit my job and started graduate school, and started a company, and lost everything. Um, and then I joined a new company after that after that failure, and I made it all back in one year. So I've had this definite ups and downs as, as, as a startup player. In that particular situation, I probably got more equity than I deserved, um, which was okay with me, as it is with many people. Um, but you know, we want to make sure we're fair on both sides. We don't want less than we deserve. We don't want more than we deserve, generally. Um, so fair is, 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 is a good strategy all, all the way. But uh, today I, I run uh, a number of companies. Uh, SlicingPie.com is my biggest one with equity splits. I also do a fair amount of consulting with startups for you know pitches and things like that and, and established companies. And I also run a, uh, a manufacturing company that manufactures mosquito nets for Boy Scout camps called Mosquito Oasis. So you are either very inventive and explorative or you have entrepreneurial ADD like I do. Yeah, the, uh, the ADD side for sure. I'm good at getting jobs. Yeah. I'm terrible at keeping them. 
Uh, well, I, I've mentioned that, uh, and so is uh, my my frequent ho- co-host Matt Watson. That we are completely unemployable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> meaning, like, I'm just not built to work for someone else. So, uh, and you know, it, I really appreciate. I didn't realize the ups and downs part. You know, and so much about this podcast has been created out of our desire to tell the real truth about being an entrepreneur. Because a lot of people just, it's not what it it appears to be on the surface to many people. Uh, it's not uncommon common at all to have had it all, lost it, yeah. made it back. And and they say that the average entrepreneur will actually, uh, the, the truly committed entrepreneur, like the lifetime member of that club is going to go broke a couple times during that lifetime. And, um, and, you know, you mentioned having to reinvent yourself and get back on it. Um, anytime you have an early stage company, this, the, the, and this is why I'm so excited about this episode, because I really wanted some expert feedback here is this whole, like, how do we split up equity? And I, and I have literally sat in rooms with people that seem to be determining their cap table during the meeting. Yep. And it's different than what they had determined before they came into the meeting and all of that. So when it comes to any business that's successful, you need to solve a problem and you're helping solve that problem. But what's the biggest problem overall, in your opinion, when it comes to slicing up the pie? The biggest problem by far is what's called a fixed equity split. So most companies, the, the first deal that most founders do with in their company is their deal between the founders. Um, so it's not with customers, it's not with developers, it's not with anybody else, it's between themselves. And as, as you said, they negotiate the, the cap table up front before any work is done. And that's, so that's the first deal. And they, use, they express this, the cap table in terms of percentages. You get X percent, I get Y percent. Most companies say, screw it, we're going to go even split because we're friends, 50-50. And when you, when you set the thing in stone, no matter what you set, it's going to be wrong because it's entirely based on guesses about future events. I can't possibly know what you're going to do for real. You can promise what you're going to do. So we can, So our equity split is based on your promises divided by my dreams. I dream we're going to be a billion-dollar company, and you're promising to bring hundreds of millions of dollars of value to it. So I say, if I give you 5%, you're going to be rich beyond your wildest dreams, and it's a ridiculous conversation. So we wind up defaulting to, you know, our, our financial projections, rules of thumbs, all just guesses about the future. So it's nice to know what you're going to get up front and that the percentage, it feels good. The problem is no matter what the number is, it's guaranteed to be wrong because you can't predict the future. So what you do is you wind up renegotiating, um, which is often very painful, and you get another fixed yeah, yeah. split. And, 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 and that, that can ruin your company on Absolutely, some days totally. too, because yeah, in a, in a lot of different ways and block your future investor path. Yeah, so, it's a, you know. a, a dirty cap table is terrible. Uh, There's a great movie out that came out a few years ago. It's called startup.com where there's three co-founders. Yeah, great. Have you seen it before? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. There's three co-founders and one of them just totally flakes out in the beginning. So they wind up buying him out for $800,000. He's the only person in the entire deal that makes any money. The guy who flakes out in the beginning because he had a bad cap table. Um, but you, know, you get another fixed table, so you got to fight about it. Again, I'll call it fix and fight. You fight about it and you fix it and fight about it and fix it. So what we need is a system that's, that's dynamic, that's based on facts. One thing I've discovered since doing this is that fairness is not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of fact. And there's only one version of fairness that exists. So if you and I are brothers and our dad gives us a cookie, there's only one way to split it. How do we split it? Right down the middle, right? We both paid equal amounts of nothing to get it. Now, sure. you could be generous and give me your half, but that doesn't make it more fair. Or I could be greedy and steal your half, but that doesn't make it more, that doesn't make it more fair. What's fair is we should get half because we each paid nothing to get it. So um, there's not multiple versions of that. There's only one version of it. So what we need is a way to decipher what that version of fairness is. And luckily in business, it's quantifiable, so we can know right down to the penny what we each deserve. So you know, and you know, just to simplify some of this, and and maybe just put some real life context in it. I think your point of like that the cookie down the middle and the brothers, you know, like it's so common for two people to start a business and be like, okay, well, we'll go 50-50. right, and we'll see what happens. And you know, like you mentioned, like one person flakes out. And that creates a whole sea of issues. So, and by the way, that is common. Exactly. That is common, especially like with multiple co-founders because, and one of the things I talk about is like, I think that in order to prevent that and look at that, like 
you got to make sure that everyone that you're involved with is equally as passionate about the business or solving the problem well, as you are. Not necessarily. That, that's where it gets interesting. So I don't suggest a 50-50 split. Okay. Um, do you know how to play black? Oh, I, w- I wouldn't either, but yeah. yeah. Do you know how to play black? How to play black uh, yeah. Let's pretend that you and I... And if, I did, if, I, if, I, if I didn't, you should be alarmed. Yeah, but yeah. Sure. Let's pretend that you and I are going to play blackjack as a team, not as opponents, but as a team because we're friends. Okay. And we're going to split the winnings 50-50 because we're buddies. So we go to the table, go to the to the uh, the riverboat, and we go to the table and we, we each bet a dollar on the same hand of blackjack. We don't know if we're going to win. We don't know how much we're going to win. We don't know how long it's going to take to win. The future is unknowable. We can't predict the future. We hope we're going to win. We're, we're confident, but we can't know for sure. So the dealer deals two aces. What do we do the aces? Split them, baby. Split them down and double down. But I'm out of cash and you're not, so you put yep. two more dollars down. So now you've bet $3 and I've only bet a dollar. The future is still unknowable. We don't know if we're going to win or how much we're going to win or how long it's going to take to win. What we know for certain is that you bet three and I bet one. If we win, does 50-50 sound fair? No. Should be 75-25. Correct. That's a logical, obvious, unambiguous outcome that you your share of the winnings should reflect your share of the bets. So startups are exactly the same thing, except that we're betting on ideas instead of cards. And you're betting time and money and relationships and facilities and supplies and equipment and all kinds of things for which you're not paid. And the value of your bet is always equal to the fair market value of that contribution. So if you're worth $100,000 a year and you work for me for a year and I don't pay you, you're effectively betting $100,000 in non-paid, in unpaid compensation. So all we got to do is observe the bets, which are easy to observe, and then base our equity split based on the bets. That's the essence of slicing pie is that your share of the winnings should be based on your share of the bets. So how do you how do you set that up from a st- in a structural way that makes sense? Because you know here's the thing, and I, I and it, to once again, I'll try to support some of this with with my own firsthand experience. I see a lot of people like, well, I need a CTO. I don't have any money, and they they're like, I'll give them twenty five percent of the company. And you know you you mentioned like, and I say this too. I'm like that person has a tangible value. It's just whatever that replacement cost would be. How how right. much would it cost if you were hiring them for cash? So if you think your business is worth $5 million. So just say that and you give away 20%, like you should have 10 years of service from a $100,000 a year employee. Am I correct in that assumption? Right. And, and we can't tell the, the, the value of the business because it's not valuable because it hasn't nothing has happened yet. Right. But we can tell the fair market value wait, of that wait employee. A, wait a minute, Mike. Wait, my, my startup that has no revenue, that has no investment or has anything is not worth this huge amount of fictional money that Absolutely I think it is. Not exactly not. It's not worth a dime. I mean, that's, is that, is that where some of the problem starts though? Is like the, the inability to actually put a real value on it. Cause you can't take it to the bank. You can't have anybody buy it. You can't leverage it against anything yet. Yeah. I always so, say, if you want to figure out how, so, how much something is worth, go try to sell it. If you can't sell it, it's either worthless or it's priceless. Right. And it's probably worth Hopefully worthless. the second. Um, you know, hopefully, in a second, but you know, so, yeah, so there's how, no information. How do, you, how do you map this out, though? How do you map this out in a way that is understood by everyone involved and to a potential investor that's going to come in later? So, there's two pieces to this model there's the allocation framework, the allocation model, which uses this betting concept to determine how much each person gets. So, the first question you should ask yourself is the same question you just, you just said How much is this person worth in the open market? What's the replacement value? What's the fair market of this person? Everybody's replaceable. Everybody has a fair, everything has a fair market value. Most companies simply pay for their contributions. They pay their employees. They pay their light bill. They pay for their rent. They pay for their supply. They simply pay their bills. Startups don't pay their bills. And the amount they don't pay is the fair market value. Okay. So all we got to do in advance is, is determine what our, uh, what our fair market value is. So we'll say you're worth $120,000 a year. That means every, every month you work for me and I don't pay you, you're betting $10,000 in unpaid compensation. If you buy a plane ticket for business and I don't reimburse you, the cost of that plane ticket is your bet. So there's two kinds of bets. There's non-cash contributions, which are don't require cash out of pocket, things like time and ideas and relationships. And there are things that do require cash out of pocket, which are things like plane tickets and unreimbursed expenses and cash investments. So in slicing pie, we use a fictional unit of, of risk. It's called a slice. It's just like a poker chip. It simply marks the fact that a bet took place. And for non-cash contribution, we give you two slices per dollar. So every time you do you work, you're adding slices to the pie. You're, you're slicing and slicing and slicing the pie. You can have infinite number of slices. So every hour that goes by at $120,000 a year is $60 in unpaid compensation, which is 120 slices. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. Then, so, so at slicingpie.com, this, this, your tra- help helping startups and businesses track yep, all those. I, I have pieces. software that helps you, helps you track it. And it's just tracking things you normally right. track. Most companies track their payroll. Most companies track their expenses. There's nothing new to track. It's just that most startups don't track it because they're not spending money. So we're, we're going to track what we're not spending in addition to what we do spend. And cash is a little bit different. If I have a thing that's worth that you want to buy that costs a hundred dollars and I'm paying you a hundred dollars an hour, it would take you more than an hour to earn enough money. Because when I pay you, I pay employment taxes and social security taxes. When you receive the money, you pay income taxes. And when you buy the thing, you pay sales taxes. So you actually get four slices per dollar in cash. So the, the model says two slices per dollar in, unca- in, in non-cash and four slices per dollar for, for cash. And you simply keep track of the, of the bets going over time. When the company can afford to pay you because it generates enough revenue, which is break even or a series A investment, then the, the pie naturally stops accumulating slices the bets are observable, and your share is your sh- your slices divided by all the slices. Just like in black, black, blackjack, it was your dollars divided by all the dollars, 75%. So in that model, that reveals the only s- certain to be fair equity split. It's nice to know you're split in advance, like I said before. The problem is no matter what it is, it's going to be wrong. In slicing pie, you don't know what you're going to get in advance, but the, you can rest assured that no matter what you get, it'll always be exactly the fair number. So this way I can add my employees, I can, I can pay my rent, I can hire whoever I want to. And I, as long as I'm making good financial decisions, I, I just keep track of the pie and it always gives me the right split. I love that, man. Now, and you know, so do some other people. Now, if you want to, if you want to check out more about what Mike Moyer does, you've written, you have some workbooks that go with this that are available on Amazon as well as the SlicingPie.com platform. Yeah, Slicing Pie Handbook is the, is the newest book on the concept. Um, I've also written a book called Slicing Pie. It came out in two thousand twelve. It's been translated into almost ten, you know, nine or ten different languages. All of it's been used by thousands of companies all over the world. Never once have I heard it fail. Um, most, I talk to a lot of lawyers all over the world. I have lawyers that work with me all over the world. And a lot of them say that about 60 to 80% of their equity deals wind up in dispute that requires legal intervention, yep. meaning you're going to probably wind up hiring a lawyer to solve your problem. And there's movies about this, you know, Facebook movies, the, the core concept of the Facebook movie is equity splits and the Steve Jobs movie, they're all you know, these, these, these equity split deals that have gone south. So, and, and, and by the way, it, it's not, I mentioned a lot of people have given this attention the, you've been on wall street journal, tech crunch, Inc, entrepreneur, Bloomberg to name a few, yeah. which are the, that's the big leagues kids that those are the people that if they're writing about you, they are paying attention to you doing something meaningful. Once again, man, I, I dig this. I think this is really cool because you know, I see this mistake a lot. And, you know, so we've had several founders and we talk about wins and losses a lot on the show. And I, man, I, I mean, I don't, there, it's come up so much that there's been problems with early stage, we'll just say partners, equity holders, yeah. anything like that. Um, and, you know, so I think we should stop for just a second and talk about what makes uh, co-founders flake. You know, and like, I mean, there's, there's a few things because I think there's, a, you know, and while this is great stuff and can help visualize this, another thing that can help is just having a little bit of acuity when it comes to the things that you might want to avoid with a co-founder. Is, is that a fair statement? Yeah. You know, there's, there's all kinds of, people have their own decisions. They make their own, their own lives. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, people might have to be all well-meaning about it, but you know, sometimes you can't afford to work for free for too long, or sometimes you, you get a job offer you want to like better, or sometimes, you know, you, you, your family gets in the way. There's all kinds of things. We, we, you can't hold people to fault for that, but we can hold them responsible for that. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that, uh, that goes, the, the second part of the slicing pie model is called the recovery framework. When someone does flake out, you want to be protected. Everyone needs to be protected in that case. So I was with a deal once where my partner and I raised $5 million on a half written business plan and a, and a PowerPoint deck. And we started the company. Congrats. We did a lot, I did a lot of work. We both did a lot of work. I did what I believe is the majority of the, of the heavy lifting. But he wrote one line in our operating agreement that allowed him to buy my shares back in the event that I was let go, even after they accelerated investing. And that one line screwed me. So when I left, my shares excel- accelerated. And he bought them back last year for probably a one twentieth of what they were worth. Um, and now I agreed to it, but that didn't make it fair. Just like in blackjack, we agreed to 50-50. Just because we agreed to it and our lawyer looked at it doesn't make it fair. And that's one of the, the biggest mistakes people make is they think that if we negotiate something in advance 
and we say we're going to do something, it's, it's, it's fair, but it's not necessarily fair. But there's, there's actually four reasons why you can flake out in a, or why you can leave a company. The first reason is you can get fired for cause. This means you weren't doing your job for whatever reason. You weren't able to do your job or not willing to do your job. And in slicing pie, you got to do warning, warning, fired. So you get your first warning is, you know, what's going on? What's the problem? Do you have the resources? Do you have the skills? Do you need additional training? What is going on? So the management has to make sure that the, 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 the job is doable. After that, if, if the behavior doesn't correct, there's another warning. So it's second warning, it's the same conversation. Third time you're fired. So warning, this, warning, this fired. Is built, this is built in at slicingpie.com? Yep, it's got to be because you got to have a chance to correct your behavior. That's amazing. No, that's yeah. great. Unless, yeah, that's the thing is like document it and yeah. we say CYA. You got to cover your ass. Yeah. Like, and, and unless you do you things, say it, yeah. Unless you're yeah. doing something totally offline, if you're embezzling or sexually harassing or bringing a gun to work, sure. it's clear. Um, you can also be fired for no good reason. I can fire you for whatever reason I want. If I'm your manager, you're fired. That's at will employment. Um, and I can fire you. You can also resign for good reason. If I make promises to you that I can't keep as your manager, you can resign for good reason. So, if I say we'll pay you in six months and six months rolls around and I can't pay you, you have good reason to resign. Or I might say we're based in Kansas City, we're moving to New York, pack your bags, move your family, not what you signed up for. So I made a promise I couldn't keep so you can resign. You can also resign for your own reasons. Maybe you don't want to work for free anymore. Maybe you don't believe in the company anymore. Maybe you just don't like me anymore. You can just quit for no reasons. If you are fired for good reason or you resign for no good reason, you lose your slices in the pie for non-cash contribution. And your cash contribution turns into a loan. Just like if you walk away from your solo mm -hmm. startup, you lose everything. If you're walking away from your bet, you lose, you, you lose the majority of your shares. On the flip side, if I fire you for no good reason or you resign for good reason, you keep your slices in the pie. You'll continue to get diluted as more people do more work. But your original bet stays in the pie and gets converted to equity when the time comes. So you're protected. So um, if you don't want to lose your slices, don't quit and don't get fired. If I don't want to give you shit. Hey, hey, Mike, I'm going to pause for a second and I'm going to say thank you for yeah, building this. Like for real, like, and it's like someone needed to do this. Like I'm shocked that I, and you know, I clearly got a lot of people that are using this and have heard about it, but man, like, like for real, this is it people. This is, this might be my new favorite startup tool. Cause because there's another thing here that that it needs to be considered because people you talk about people figuring it out later it's not healthy for your company to have a bunch of infighting jealousy and bullshit going on like you're like oh yeah well we if we have a contract i'm like yeah well what happens to your business if everyone right. wants to kill each other right and and you know that's and that's a, that's a problem like and, and, you know, the main thing I, that I hear about is the co just the co-founder, the flaky co-founder, you know, like that person that just didn't either didn't have the vision. They didn't care. I think you got to be careful because a lot of, a lot of people aren't built for that entrepreneur lifestyle. Like they just are never going to quit that job. They're never, or, and, and, or they have a partner at home that doesn't feel like, look, as you get, it's easier to be a startup co-founder when you're 25, not married and don't have kids. Yeah. And, and a lot of people get to a specific reality and, and, and this is harder and harder when you get, okay, in Kansas city, it's not expensive to live here. And you went to school at KU and it's like our cost of living is lower in Chicago. If you live downtown, it's more expensive or New York. And like, it can be tough for people to quit their job. Yeah. And that, and, and they just, some people just don't ever feel comfortable. I've known some brilliant people that would have probably been very great in a co-founder situation, but they're scared shitless to work for anyone other than like a four Fortune 500 company. Yeah. And, you know, so like, that's one of the things I, I think you got to always be aware of. And because, you know, that's what happens is now you've promised someone 30%. There's nothing. Okay. Look, when you may, if you may, if you, do, if you aren't using slicing pie and I love, and once again, love this, I'm like endorsing this in so many different ways. And that's because I think it's, it's amazing, but you know, that's what happens is like, I give Mike 30% of the company and we didn't think it out. We didn't do anything about it. We didn't have any tools like this to track our contribution and he quits. And now all of a sudden he owns 30% of the yeah. business. And I, it's, it's back to that blackjack scenario, except for you lost your hand. I won mine. And then you still, you not only do you want half, you want three quarters and not, you know, and, and the thing is, is it, we had a recent, uh, uh, guest uh, that had talked about how they they had I mean this company was th this kid gave blood 
to start his business. Literally don't gave blood plasma to get it started like through and through. And they ended, they finally got funded. And then the first $60,000 they had 100% of it went to, went to, uh, resolve a legal dispute (sighs) over equity split. And like, think about how it's, but here's the thing is you have to, and part of why we do this podcast is to share the good, bad, and the ugly. Cause until you've done it once, until you've sat down and you've done, you've sliced up pie, like it just, it feels like it could or should be easy. And in that early stage of the business, your level of optimism and unrealistic expectations are trading at an all time high. Yeah. They should be, you know, and, and, Well, right, right. But the thing is, is like you, if you, a good agreement and a good understanding covers rainy days and sunny days. So you got to, you know, like, and no one wants to talk about what we're going to do if things crater, but you need to, you need to, and it needs to be something that's understood now. um, So everyone's trying to raise capital. One thing that is important if you're trying to raise capital is that you have your finances in order. So I do want to once again, recommend that everyone get a a CFO. If you can't afford one, you can get a fractional CFO, similar to Crown CFO, the sponsor of today's episode. Um, Go to crowncfo.com forward slash hustle. I'm curious, have you ever used a fractional CFO? I, I have actually. I have a good friend who, do, who does, is a fractional CFO. He doesn't work for Crown, but I got to make sure Crown is familiar with slicing pie. <laughs> well, no, I'm going to recommend it to him. But yeah, that's a, that's a big thing. And, and and if your finances aren't in order, your ability to get funded is pretty much going to evaporate. Now, well, that's one of the now, important things. You know, that, one of the nice things about slicing pie is it forces you to have the, the, the discussion about what's the fair market value. So you know your cost structures, you know what your inputs are. When you don't have that conversation, you have no idea what your inputs are to your business. And that's one of the things that CFO can help. How, you how is how is this received in the investor community? Like so now, so Mike, we started this business together, and we were smart, and we used slicing pie, and we're tracking it, and now we got a little traction, and uh, X Y Z uh, fund is coming, and they want to put money into us. When we show this is how we're determining our cap table and all of that, like what what do investors usually say? So I've never heard a single situation where investors is turned down a deal because of slicing pie. In most cases, it's not even relevant to them. What's relevant to them is there's a clean, conflict-free cap table, which is exactly what slicing pie delivers. I tell people there's three kinds of investors. There are investors who put in sweat equity and small amounts of cash. They're part of the pie. They're your, they're your team. There are investors who invest their own money in amounts that are too small to fund your operation in the foreseeable future. Those folks are called angel investors. And there are folks who invest other people's money in amounts that are large enough to fund your operation in the foreseeable future. They're called venture capitalists. So an angel investor should not receive a priced round, a percentage. They should receive a convertible note because there's simply not enough information available to you or the investor to make a good decision about how much it's worth. A VC, on the other hand, is qualified, hopefully, to negotiate a price. So small investments get convertible notes, which aren't part of the pie, and large investments get a pre-negotiated rate, a priced round, which is an equity investment. Um, So in that that scenario, slicing pie isn't necessarily relevant to them as long as the 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 pie is clean, and that's what it always delivers. Um, There is there are some investment tools you can use for slicing pie investments that are for non-team members, like there's a slicing pie loan where I can take a loan from someone and make regular payments. But if I skip the payment, it becomes part of the pie. Um, but for the most part, investors like to see clean, ca- conflict-free cap tables, which is exactly what you get with slicing pie. So we've you've used the phrase conflict-free cap tables. And I like to, I like to keep shows, especially with this, relevant for people at all levels of experience and input and all that. Um, so th- what are a few things that, that make a cap table dirty or makes, make an investors go, mm. well, one of the biggest things is setting a premature valuation. <clears throat> so premature valuation is where I give my mom 10% of the company for $10,000. So by doing that, I've implied that 10% is worth $10,000. So the whole company is worth hundred thousand dollars. So now my, my equity has a valuation on it. And in legal sense, if there's a meeting of the minds on what equity is worth, then everyone will agree that's what it's worth. So when I issue shares to you, I've, I've just caused an income situation for you that might be taxable. Plus, when I've exhausted my $100,000, I 
um, I'm out of equity. And so I got to do subsequent shares with more meaning, meaningless valuation. So that's one of the biggest problems is setting a premature valuation when I give it percentages away to small investors. The other problem is when I give too much of my equity away to advisors and partners and just give little chunks in this away, you know, it's, it's all coming out of the founders, the original founders uh, share and it, it, gets, it gets to be ugly and, and, and cause problems. Another one's called debt equity. Debt equity is when I have a disgruntled co-founder that doesn't work for the company anymore who owns shares. And those person can, can cause all kinds of problems. They can even block deals and, and that kind of stuff. In slicing pie, there are absentee shareholders in some cases when they, if they get fired, for instance, um, but they're usually on good terms with the company because they're being treated fairly. Um, and there are all kinds of, you know, those do special deals where I get, you know, options and warrants, which are great for established companies, but they're not great for startup companies. Uh, you know, it's, it's mind boggling when I hear an attorney recommend an option program for a startup because the, the strike price is zero dollars. You might as well sell them actual shares. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a worthless piece of paper. So um, clean cap table means that everyone has what they deserve and there's no uh, pointless arguments about or disagreements in the, in the manager team in terms of uh, fairness. All right, so this stuff gets really complex and dirty for founders on many levels when they finally find someone that wants to write a check. Um, one of the things that I say a lot is, yeah, okay, so when it comes to you raising money and you getting it done, the thing that you have to consider uh, ahead of time is the investor is not on your team until you cash the check and sign the paperwork. Yeah. Um, I think this is a mistake that a lot of a lot of inexperienced people make. Because uh, look, uh, and the reason is, look, it's the it's the investor's job or the whatever entity's job or whomever's job to get the best deal they can for themselves until they are fully on top of the team. Um, what are a few, what are a few things that you could advise our listeners on when it comes? All right. So here's the thing that, that business that we started, we thought it was worth 5 million bucks and you know, we've been using slicing pie. We're tracking all this stuff, but now the investor comes along and they're like, guys, you're worth like $1.2 million at best. So how do, does does your program also help you get some idea on what a reasonable value for your company could be? And that, and by the way, it's only worth what you can sell, what you can what you can raise. Yeah. It. But you know, like you said, it's well. I used to collect baseball cards when I was a kid, and I'd be like, "Dad, this is worth ten bucks." He's like, "Cool, you got someone to give ten bucks to you because if not, it's not worth shit." Yeah. Um. You know, and if you could, and then you take it to the baseball card store, and they're like, "Well, the book says ten, but I need to buy it from five. So technically, that card is worth five dollars to you, not ten. Um. So, is there anything built in here, or any advice, or anything you can give? Because I think establishing evaluation valuations is a shit show for pretty much everyone until you start getting some rounds come in or you have a reliable stream of income that can, you know, be proven at some right. point. The, one of the most important things I tell startups is if you have a good deal, you'll get other investors. Don't feel like you have to take investors money. Um, people get, they get desperate and they get, they, they, they get anxious and they, they cut stupid deals because they're, they're desperate. If you have a good deal, you'll find investors. That's not the problem. The problem is you don't have a good deal. And so you're trying to convince someone who doesn't know better to invest a lot of money sometimes. Um, what deals lack are data. There's no data in a startup. There's no customers. There's no revenues. There's no transactions. There's no history. There's no information. So without information, we can't ascertain the value. You know, we have plenty of information on Apple computer and we still don't know if it's going to go up or down tomorrow. So but we have much more information. We can, we can set a value more reliably to a publicly traded company because there's plenty of data if it's established. But startups, we can't. Uh, so you got to be, you got to, you got to collect data and show data. So I, I got to show what my cost structures are. I got to show what my traction is. I got to show what my cost of acquisition is. I got to continually show investors what I can, what I can demonstrate. If I don't have that, I can't set a reliable price. So I got to try to stick with the convertible note and uh, get a, get an, an angel investor convertible note. And for those of your listeners who don't know how a convert, convertible note works, it's basically a loan that someone gives you that instead of paying it off, you convert it to equity at the first official round of, of, of investment, so the first VC round. Um, but one thing that's also important is your company is not worth the sum of its inputs. I can work for a year at $100,000 a year unpaid. That doesn't mean my company's worth $100,000. It could still be worth nothing if I'm spinning my wheels for a year. Um, hopefully, it's worth a lot more than your inputs. So you can't you can't predict value in advance. You can't base value on your inputs. So slicing pie doesn't isn't a good is not a good tool for setting a value 
a good tool for setting value is showing traction, showing success, and negotiating with real investors. So I, I talk to a lot of people about raising capital, and I always joke because I, I there's so many companies that are sent, seem to be centric on that, and they I and so I'm a salesperson at heart, you know, and um, I, I'm a marketer, a salesperson, a promoter. I value revenue, and um, I, I get, have these conversations with people. They're like, raise, raise, raise. I'm like, you know, you guys should maybe stop and sell uh, sell something along the way. Uh, cause that will validate it. What in your, in your opinion and experience, or even with your, with slicing pie, what are, what are a few of the things that are guaranteed that are, I, I don't want to say guaranteed cause guess what people, nothing's guaranteed. Um, but what are, what are the, what are the top things that are going to tick that, uh, the, either the interest that investors will have in you or that valuation up rapidly? The best thing I think is, uh, um, marketing expenses. If I can show that if I spend a dollar on marketing, I'll get $5 back, then I can find investors to the cows come home. There's no limit to how much money I can raise yep. as long as I can show that reliably. My software doesn't matter. My team doesn't matter. My financial plan doesn't matter. My patents don't matter. What matters more than anything else is my ability to predictably market the product. And then I can get money thrown at it all day long. But I got to know that my ex, you know, my dollars worth of spend results in in, in whatever worth of income, and that's that's a great investment. So that's and by the way, that is uh, another mistake I see a lot of people make is they want to go out and raise money, and I like so it's not an uncommon thing for me to look at a pitch deck or something, and people are like, well, what do you think? What are we worth? I'm like. You don't have you don't even define your path to revenue in here, yeah. guy. Like, I, how much does it cost you to get a user? They're like, well, we're going to figure that out. I'm like, well, you're not going to get. No one's going to give you money, or at least a lot of money. No one's smart until. Yeah, you, well, I mean, you might catch an angel here and there because yeah. they believe in you. They believe in the problem you solve. They like the industry. Like, like, okay, in January, no one wanted to invest in ed tech, and that's true. Yeah. And now, every, uh, you talk to anybody in the oh, ed techs in this set, there was an article, it was TechCrunch or Walt, or the journal or something yesterday. It was like, ed tech is now a necessity, you know? And it's like, so, you know, you don't, you don't know what you're going to get. You don't know where you're going to be with all that. So, uh, you know, but as far as getting a lot of money, yeah, you're right. And that's, so really the, the, what I found is when the real money is about to come in your business, it is, uh, and it supports your comments. Like, uh, the real investors that want to write big checks want to come in at the point where you just they, they're where they know they have the blowtorch that lights the fuse yeah. on your rocket ship, and you know so. But along that way, you have to sell something. So I, I talk till I'm blue in the face about how important that is early. And even if you even if you end up being wrong, you, you, it's back to that credible. Uh, quantifiable data because, Hey, if I, okay. So if my million dollars gets us back $5 million, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people right. that are going to line Plenty up with million dollar checks. Cause that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So, okay. There's, so there's, there's a notion of this minimally viable product, the MVP. I always tell people that you want to create a minimally viable, viable, valuable product, not a minimally viable product. Being viable is one thing, being valuable is another. So I always push you to say, what if your product is valuable, someone will pay for it. I know you can give it away. Uh, what I want to know is someone will pay for it. Yeah. And that's, I think that, you know, we've done episodes in the past about early stage mistakes and, and in my, in my book, million dollar bedroom, I, I emphasize the point of understanding your path to revenue. And I, I just, that's a critical error. So many people make, they're like, yeah, you know, we, we got it all figured out. I'm like, okay, cool. How long is it going to take you to put a dollar in the bank? Um, because it's different, you know, like, so at, at full scale, that's the, the company I own. Uh, we're, we're tech services. So we had a very short path to revenue because we have to find a service provider and find a client. Uh, if you have a software as a service company like Matt Watson and I own or invest had invested in several, uh, sometimes those have almost no foreseeable or it doesn't feel like a foreseeable future of profitability. Yeah. So you are cash dependent and you need that money coming in. Uh, the valuation, it still kind of baffles me on some days. The, but a software company is might get an eight to ten multiple, where a service related company might get a two x multiple, even though it's profitable. So yeah. there, you know, this shit's all over the place, people, and you got to know what you're getting into and where you're going to be at. But you know, and and by the way, the best form of of capital, and that is is revenue. Yeah, it's non dilutive. 
So go get some. Now, uh, once again, today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Crown CFO. Um, and I want to talk to you about having prepared financials because I think that that's an important thing before we end. If you want to learn what Crown CFO can do for you, go to crowncfo.com forward slash hustle. You can also go back and listen to our episode titled, Do I Need a CFO? Um, so, you know, I, I, I once again, talking about things we talk about till we're blue in the face. Uh, what are a few tips when it comes to tracking and like, what are, what are the KPIs and different stuff like that? If you just had to pick a couple that, that you have found to be the most useful, relevant and sellable. Well, certainly your cost of acquisition is something that's important. You know, when I did my, I started a company a few years ago, I told you we did a $5 million raise. Everybody we talked to invested except for the one person that asked me point blank, what's your cost of acquisition? And I didn't have an answer for him. That's the only guy who didn't invest. Not good. And he was yeah, probably not smart good. not to. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, certainly the, the cost of acquisition, what your revenues are, are, um, are the, the numbers that I really care about. And then you got to know what your cost structures are. It's really easy to invest a lot of resources if you're not paying for them. And you'll never know if the, those resources are going to pay off. So, I, you know, I have guys that tell me that they've, they've been running their company for five years and still haven't launched their product. I mean, that sounds insane to me. I mean, if that's that, that's half a million dollars in unpaid salary or more. You, if you if you ask the person, would you invest half a million dollars in unpaid salary to get to where you are today, which is nowhere, would you be willing to do it? Most of them would say no. Um, so knowing what your cost structures are are, are, are critically important. And then most of the time we just ignore those because we're not actually paying things out. So while we're here on the subject, because uh, once again, we like to tell cautionary tales, um, what are a couple things that uh, that uh, that someone raising capital can do that are going to almost certainly exclude you from getting anybody to write you a check? The, the path to revenue is probably the most important thing. Is 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 just not knowing that path to revenue. I you know I speak to guys. People come to me a lot for investment because of what I do. And for me, it's it's always you're too early, you're too early, you're too early because I want to see that revenue. I want to see that, I want to see some traction. Companies that make a lot of money that raise a lot of money either have defendable intellectual property that's, that's very unique. They have huge customer bases that may not generate revenue, but are hard to replicate like WhatsApp, or they have, you know, revenues that, that, that show a growth curve. Um, I, you know, I do some investment, but I look for deals that, that have one of those things. Um, they also try to pitch value that doesn't exist. We can't ever know the value of a component part. Uh, I have a sailboat and, uh, and, and it's a big boat and it's, I sail a lot and it, it's, it's fun. There's, there's, a, there's a pin in the backstay of the boat that if that pin is missing, the boat doesn't work. So that 25 cent pin is essentially worth the entire value of the boat. So if I, if, I, if I was to assign value to parts, that would be one of the most important parts on the boat. So would the keel. So would the cabin. So would the sails. So everything's got an important part. You can't take away one part and have it not valuable. Um, so trying to value, try, trying to, get to argue that, you know, without me, there's no business or without this investment, there's no business. Everything's always worth the fair market value as an input. Um, hopefully combined, it'll be worth more. Um, but you can't value individual pieces as as their future value. You can only value value them at the fair market value. You, the, your comments and those that's spot on. I love the pen comment because you, you know there are that uh, we talk about. We've talked in the past a lot about the way setting up your business. So I re, there's a term that I use called a tiny general. A tiny general is something in your business that is got way too much power and control to run yeah. something way too important. Like, dude, that twenty. Okay, so if you're out in the middle at sea and that twenty five cent pin uh, falls out and the boat's useless, um, well, you're you're in trouble, right? So, would it make more sense to have a couple? Do you? Ha I'm curious. Do you have a couple of those pins in the boat bag just them, in yeah. case? They're easier. To That's my point. So, right. So some of the, you know, one of the, what was coming in my head, what was in my head when you're talking about that is first off, build your business. So it doesn't have tiny generals, meaning like the, so, some component of it or some, it, it, some part of your business doesn't become completely dysfunctional if that person is gone or is missing. And second off, if your business is, if the value or the future of it is suddenly grossly, 
changed by the absence of something, then honestly, you might not have that great of a business right. or it might not be that scalable because it's not, it's not, you know, I hear people say that uh, we hear actually employ this place is going to fall apart without me. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, on day, maybe on day five, but most of the time the company's bigger than you and they're going to figure out how to do shit when you're not around. So, uh, that's a, that's a short sighted way to look at yourself as an employee or a founder. And, and then once again, you talk to investors and like, the thing is, is like, you hear terms like key man and stuff like that. And that might be at, at but you know, the, your goal should be to build something that's bigger than you. Definitely. Cause if you, if it's, because if you don't, you're never going to exit, it's going to fully be dependent on you. And you're that pin at the end of the boat. And I, I like to think I'm worth more than 25 cents, but that's a great analogy. You know, one so once again, that, with it, one, had, one thing that people often get confused with equity is they confuse equity with compensation. <clears throat> it's not compensation. Right. So what I tell people is the ultimate goal is to take your equity, hire somebody to replace you, and go retire on the beach. And the only way you yeah, can I'm, do that I'm, making, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a note here to remind my wife that she can't buy groceries with full scale shares. Exactly. So I do appreciate that coming up. But yeah. You know, if you work for uh, Apple um, Computer and Apple Computer and Steve Jobs said to you, I'm sorry, um, if you work for Amazon and, and, and uh, Bezos said to you, hey, we just learned you own Amazon stock. Good news. We don't have to pay your salary anymore. It would be yeah. ridiculous. Salary and company and equity are separate things. They're not the same things. You don't, you don't pay someone in equity. They earn equity. So once again, with us today, we've got Mike, Mike Moyer, the inventor of Slicing Pie. Uh, go to slicingpie.com. Uh, this has been great. I've, I've really enjoyed this to the point like I could probably do about 10 episodes with you because I know we just scratched the surface. If you want more information about Mike, about Slicing Pie, go to slicingpie.com. Click some of the links that are in the show notes. Now, Mike, we end episodes of Startup Hustle with what we call the Founders Freestyle. And, uh, and it's funny because I can I for those of you that are listening and we don't publish our video feed. Mike is actually holding a microphone right now. So it, we normally pass the virtual mic to our guest and ask what is based on today's content and episode, what's a tip that you could give for a founder or something that you may have left unresolved in the episode that you would like to mention before we, uh, before we end the show? I think the most important thing that I want people to always understand is this, this whole idea that there's only one version of fairness that is, is, that's real. If you have an opinion about what fairness is and I have an opinion on what's, what's fair, one or both of us is going to definitely be wrong. Our model should always point to the same result no matter who fills in the blanks. And if you're negotiating fair market values and you're being smart about your investments, then it shouldn't matter who fills out the blanks. The, the, the results should always be the same. Um, so I always encourage people to think that way. If you, there's no such thing as multiple versions of fairness. Um, so that's what slicing pie does for us. It, it helps. It tells you what that version of fairness is that that's actually fair. And, uh, without it, you're, you're definitely going to have an unfair split. Uh, and I'm going to parlay off that uh, to close because you mentioned like if two people, okay, so perception is reality and what may, you know, and, and don't leave your business. So it's, uh, one one of the one of the uh, better quotes that I have from Startup Hustle was recently, uh, "Hope is not a strategy." Yeah, and uh, so like the like you mentioned, like hoping that the equity is going to do this or going to do that. So and these and look, perception changes over time. So anything you can do to make this stuff tangible, look, this slicing pie is super affordable. People like you trust me. If you can't afford slicing pie, then you have bigger problems than determining what your equity is worth. So I'm gonna let you go to the site and learn more about that. Um, you know, and, and you know, it's not often when I when I'm here in the show going, dude, try this, try this. But I love stuff like this because, okay, so for the price, uh, okay, you, you know, we're talking you know, twenty bucks a month, uh, depending on how you pay for it, it could be cheaper. <laughs> the thing is, is what's your time worth? What is your time worth for trying to figure out all this crap? and track all this stuff. There's a tool out there that makes these things. I'll give you an example, like liveplan.com. I have written a gazillion business plans with a bunch of people, done a bunch of financials, and I always use it. It's 20 bucks a month. And you know why? Because it makes the financial tables and setting them up and making them presentable and not wrong. It makes it a breeze. It's worth it because the amount of time it would take to put that stuff in and out of a spreadsheet or do a bunch of different stuff 
is expensive. My time is expensive. If you have the opportunity to repurpose your own time into something that actually moves your business forward rather than squabbling, defining, or doing other stuff, give it a shot, people. I mean, it, it's really a smart way to do it. Now, with that, I mean, I, I got to go because, well, first off, we've said pie so many times in this episode. I'm freaking hungry, dude. Um, I want to go get some pie. So I'm going to go do that and I'll catch up with you later, Mike. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.